I write most of my stories in the first person, and I put myself centre stage in almost all the stories that I write. Sometimes I even call the character, main character Michael because I can't think of anything else, I'm that pathetic. But I do put myself at the heart of a story, particularly if I, I have to feel that I'm there. Now, for instance, I wrote a book called Private Peaceful. I wrote this book because of one thing I came across in a museum. I went to a place called Ypres in Belgium, which is the site of a terrible battle in the First World War. There's a wonderful museum there called In Flanders Field. I was walking out of the museum in tears because it's such a powerful evocation of the futility of war, as Wilfred Owen called it. So you come out feeling wretched. And the last thing I saw was a little letter in a frame on the wall. And it said, Dear Mrs. So-and-so, we regret to inform you that your son, Private So-and-so, with a number, was shot at dawn for cowardice on such and such a date, 1916. And just above the little letter was an envelope ripped open. And as I, as I saw the rip, my mind just went straight to the mother. And I could see her standing there, opening this envelope, knowing it was bad news, and then discovering not only was her son dead, but the manner of his dying, how terrible that must have been. And then I thought, hang on, it's not good enough just to feel this find out more about it. So I went to the Mount Museum, I said, how many soldiers were shot for cowardice in the First World War? And he said, over 300, and that's just on our side. And you just, you just can't imagine a world where that sort of thing happened. I found it shocking, and then what I discovered was that all these years later, this country had not pardoned them. So I thought, write a story about it. How do you write a story about it, I thought. Somehow you have to find the voice that shines the camera, if you like, at the story in the most powerful way that you possibly can. And in this particular case, what I decided to do was to tell the story from the point of view of one soldier. There are two soldiers in my story, brothers. And you don't know in the story which of them is going to get shot. What you do know is that in the morning at 6 o'clock, when it always happened, something terrible is going to happen. And you're with one of these soldiers. And I tell it in the first person. I'm going to read you just half a page. This was my attempt, really, to become a 17-year-old young man writing, speaking, in 1916. And it begins... Five past ten. They've gone now, and I'm alone at last. I have the whole night ahead of me, and I won't waste a single moment of it. I shan't sleep it away, I won't dream it away either, I mustn't, because every moment of it will be far too precious. I want to try to remember everything, just as it was, just as it happened. I've had nearly 18 years of yesterdays and tomorrows, and tonight I must remember as many of them as I can. I want tonight to be long, as long as my life, not filled with fleeting dreams that rush me on towards dawn. Tonight, more than any other night of my life, I want to feel alive. It's tumbling upon things, you know. I mean, I was lucky enough, privileged enough to, 35 years ago, to um, meet in my pub at home in Devon a soldier who'd been to the First World War. I knew he was an old bloke, he was in his 80s by then, and he'd... Um, I knew he'd been there, but I didn't know any more about him. I hardly knew him, really. And I sat down and had a half a pint with him. And I just asked him the question. I said, what regiment were you in? He says, I was in the Devon Yeomanry. And then he said something wonderful, which I'd never forgotten. He said, I was there with horses. I said, what do you mean with horses? He said, well, cavalry. And then he started talking, and he started talking. And he told me what it was like to be 17, to leave these shores, to go across with the, the Yeomanry, and find himself in this appalling, appalling war. How he felt petrified, and how he found comfort in talking to his horse each night when he went to the horse lines to feed it. And he would talk to that horse as if it was his best friend, because it was his best friend. And he meant it. 
And I thought this is the most extraordinary thing I've ever heard, someone like this who talks to a horse. And then I thought, I'm not sure anyone's told this story of a horse. And maybe if you told it through the horse's mouth, you could tell the story not just of the British side or the German side or the French side, but a story of the universal suffering of the First World War. You have to forget when you're sitting in front of an empty page, I think, that you are writing. What I've dis discovered is the best way to do it is to do what most kids like doing, which is to talk a story. You talk it from your head where the dream time has been, down your arms, through your fingers onto the page, and you let it flow, which means mistakes and all. You don't worry about the spelling, you don't worry about the punctuation. I'm sorry, but you don't, not the first time. You just get the stupid thing down there. I think it's rather like an artist sketching. You know, when an artist is sketching, it, it's letting the line flow, capturing somehow the image of it. And that's what I do when I first write. I tell it down onto the page and then craft it afterwards. I think if you're a writer, you have to live a really interesting life. You have to talk to people, listen to people, go places, read books like crazy, fiction, non-fiction, watch telly, watch movies, simply drink the world into your head so that you have this huge well full of the events of your life.